Trigger warning, this one is very brutal, very graphic. On the Halloween morning, 1968, off of Laurel Canyon, Edward Weber, a personal assistant, enters the home of his boss and finds the place has been ransacked. He called out his boss's name, but there was no reply. The living room was a disaster. Furniture was wrecked, pictures were tossed around, there's an overturned chair next to his elderly boss's broken eyeglasses and a bloody footprint. He checked his boss's bedroom and in the darkness was able to make a form out of a body on the bed. It was his boss. His face caked with blood, body bruised head to toe, naked with his hands bound behind him, wrist to ankles uh, a sheet covering below his knees wrist to ankles yeah you're yeah your oh wrists God, are tied like to your pig? ankles like a pig yeah like a pig on the spit uh, is that a term yeah like a luau there i'll put it in island terms you can understand wow. there was a broken cane lying near his body he couldn't see this at the time edward couldn't see this at the time but on the corpse's back the letter either n or z had been carved into him mm, wasn't me it was, it was in. It was in. Zorro. Yes. It was the gay blade. It's kinky Zorro. <laughs> what he could see was what was written on the mirror, reminiscent of the most famous candy murder, which was less than a year away. Oh, Sharon Tate's. On the mirror, it was written, us, in the luau. us girls are better than the F word used as a slur in the gay community. And it was spelled wrong too. F-A-G-I-T-S. Us girls are better than that. Under his body written on the sheets was the name Larry. <laughs> Like Lawrence, not like the you, rail line. You've killed me, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> and again, the name Larry appeared written on a telephone pad near the phone. The body was that of early film star and closeted homosexual Roman Navarro. Mm. And this is his story, at least part of it. For those who don't know the name... Thank you. Thank you. And that's how, that's where I'm ending. Thank you. <laughs> For those who don't know, Roman Navarro was part of a trio of handsome and beloved matinee men from the 20s. <laughs> there was Rudolph Valentino, who was another subject of the first Creepy Christmas. Mm -hmm. There was John Gilbert, and there was Roman Navarro. All had fantastic mustaches. <laughs> Valentino died at the end of the 20s. They, they, they had to share one, though. <laughs> My turn. How can we never see them in public together? <laughs> the process of switching mustaches <laughs> is uh, pretty... They're, they're Superman. <laughs> Valentino died at the end of the 20s, and Gilbert's career didn't last to the talkies, but Navarro was devastatingly handsome and had a fine voice for speaking and singing. His biggest role was starring as the titular character in 1925's silent version of Ben-Hur, A Tale of Christ. Oh. My favorite lines of his were, um, it was a silent movie. <sighs> Navarro was in, born in Durango, Mexico in 1899. <laughs> I just remember that one scene where he walks in and he goes... <laughs> Oh, you guys can't see, but we're overacting right now. He <laughs> was born in Durango, Mexico in 1899 to a well-established dentist. Ramon was one of 13 children. Ew. The family moved around Mexico for a time, but ended up in Los Angeles in 1911. His father became fatally ill at one point, putting the responsibility of the family into Ramon's hands. He had several odd jobs. He was a busboy at the Alexandria Hotel. He mm. taught piano lessons. He was a theater usher. He was a grocery store clerk. But really, most of all, Ramon wanted to be in entertainment with a focused eye on opera. He got noticed as a cafe. What color did he like? wearing yellow oh no what, what shade do? whatever canaries are I was, no. I was hoping you wouldn't say canary because that's the only shade <laughs> and i was gonna say no this guy like canary uh, that's the only shade of yellow i know mustard's another minion one. yellow <laughs> <laughs> banana <laughs> He got noticed as a cafe singer and started picking up little jobs in movies here and there in 1921 it's a small town idol and the same year the four horsemen of apocalypse is hey I know we've talked about that movie before, but I can't remember why. Was Rudolph Valentino in that? I didn't check, but probably. I know we've said the words before. You want to look it up right now? No. Okay. We'll, we'll let our adoring fans do it. They're going to write us angry. <laughs> Bruno's going to come back and <laughs> correct all this. Son. Our editor. His big break came the next year as the villain in The Prisoner of Zenda, as well as The Arab in 1924. The rule of Ben-Hur would come the following year and make him everything that he is. After that, he started breaking in like $1,000 a week courtesy of MGM, and he built a 17-room mansion for his family, which I think, if this is the same place, a Frank Lloyd Wright built it for him. But then he shared it with a lover. So it was called the Samuel Navarro House. No one died there, so I could, it wasn't in the canyons. He was the also able to perform for an opera and keep up his acting roles which is pretty cool his first role in a talkie was in 1929's devil may care and he kept it up with a role that sounds familiar too i don't know yeah i think valentino's Maybe for sure my attitude i'm thinking of i just my hairstyle <laughs> devil may hair but i ask when i go to a barbershop they say again this is a salon you need to leave he kept it up with a role in the matahari with garbo and then the barbarian in 1934 alongside cutie and orange fiend mirna loy no not she's Mirna Loy. She's at it again. Ah, oh, Mirna. How are we going to make her stop being in movies? Do we have to kill her in a canyon? <laughs> 
coming next year. He was being billed as a Latin lover and women across the world ached for Ramon, but Ramon did not feel the same way about women across the world. <laughs> and being Catholic, the guilt of being homosexual ate away at him. He would usually enjoy the company of male escorts for three years, paying for everyone to have a good time until they left and guilt and depression took him out for a good time. <laughs> Buy me a drink first of cyanide. <laughs> but although he could transcend from silence to talkies, his career kind of dwindled when that style of acting kind of died mm. out in the 30s. Uh, the rest of his career, he started in little things here and there and found some work on television, that new revolutionary thing. <laughs> he kept up with movies and singing through the 30s, but his reluctance grew to keep acting. And through the 40s, he spent most of it not acting. He spent most of his time on a 50-acre ranch he bought in San Diego. The last movie he was in officially was 1960s Haller in Pink Tights. And he carried out some TV roles through the it's decade. A career. Yeah. Truly, though, he was emotionally done with acting years before that. In the late 60s, he was age-wise in his late 60s, approaching 70. He was a lonely alcoholic living in the Hollywood Hills, now just keeping up with escorts and drinking his guilt away. <laughs> now comes Larry. Larry. And then along comes Larry. Larry. Uh, Hiya. They're going to die. Uh, <laughs> the Larry, whose name was written all over the crime scene, refers to Larry Ortega. Larry was a prostitute and a hustler who had worked for a famous Hollywood arranger, which is a nice way to say pimp, named Mr. Richard. I cannot find anything else on Mr. Richard. <laughs> Mr. Richard. You will get the innuendo there. Oh. I think. I don't even like know. Like Nixon. Like tricky dicks. <laughs> oh. Oh no. oh, no. Um, I want to find out about this Mr. Richard character, but I, there's nothing out there. Uh, Someone Larry put me in contact with Mr. Richard. <laughs> Tell him business is back in business. <laughs> <laughs> He's business. Larry has a sister named Mari, who he hooked up with a pal of his and a fellow juggalo. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. They've always been around. <laughs> We've always been here. Larry had a sister named... Um, <laughs> I'm a male juggalo. <laughs> the only juggalo to ever get laid. Take that juggalo community. Your president won. Deuce buggalo male <laughs> juggalo. Larry had a sister. He oh, he has a sister. He hooked his sister up with a friend of his who is a gentleman of the evening named Paul Ferguson. Enter rough and tumble Paul Ferguson, <laughs> brother-in-law to Larry. Something about the docks. Paul had recently... Yeah, I could have been a contender, too. <laughs> Paul had recently been dumped by his wife and was picking up money working the streets of Hollywood. Larry gave Ferguson a juicy bit of info. Found a penny on the way in here. You're, are, that's the same thing. Money on the streets, picking it up. <laughs> working those streets. Working the streets for all they've got. Recycling. <laughs> Pennies. Rocks that are shiny. I could trick a bank. <laughs> Larry gave Ferguson a juicy bit of info on an old... John, who mm -hmm. lived up in the Hollywood Hills. He was an old movie star who liked to have sex with escorts, and he had about $5,000 cash hidden in his house. And oh boy, did Ferguson like to hear that. He hooked up with his 17-year-old brother, Tom, and the two contacted Navarro, saying that not only would you get Paul, but also his underage brother. <laughs> so the Ferguson brothers went over to Navarro's home in Laurel Canyon and began drinking together. Ramon Navarro's personal assistant, Edward Weber, who the next day would find his employer's body, came by around 6 p.m. and dropped off cigarettes for Ramon, but never entered the house. The night carried on with drinks, but when the clock struck sexy time, Ferguson wasn't <laughs> having any of it. Paul Ferguson had a lot of remorse and regret about his desperate lifestyle and he hated having sex with men for money. And when it came time for that to happen, Ferguson lost it and began beating Navarro until he was unconscious. Oh man. So together they dragged a 70 year old man to the bath and washed the blood off him. And when Navarro began slowly regaining consciousness, Paul flew into a rage and began what? pummeling <laughs> Navarro. <laughs> Just because he was waking up? Basically. He started hitting him with the riding cane that they, they so hard that mm. he broke the cane. He hit him in the head and the shoulders until Navarro <laughs> laid on the ground and it was there that he choked on his own blood. Mm. Then they tried to stage the scene, dragging him to the bedroom, tying his hands up to look like it was like a sex act gone mm. wrong, writing that dumb crap on the mirror to make it appear as if it was a woman that had committed the act. It makes that, sense why oh. Larry's name was written by the telephone, but it doesn't make sense to me and I can't really figure out why, why they wrote it on the bed sheets. Yeah, Maybe he was like still kind of alive and Larry. Kind of Larry. Uh, the only name I remember from <laughs> these joy boys. They also placed an unused condom in his dead hand. Tom Ferguson, mm -hmm. the younger brother, made, oh, they, I guess they're staging the scene so they put like an unused condom in his hand like so it like, almost hey, they didn't even start yet yeah basically tom ferguson made a 48 minute phone call to chicago and on the way out of his house they asking if he spelled the f word right <laughs> what do you mean this dude you're gonna make me say it again <laughs> you know the word you know that new word you're looking <laughs> for please don't say it <laughs> <laughs> on their way out of the house they blew they threw all the bloody clothes in a neighbor's backyard they also blew some dude um <laughs> do we have time no <laughs> laurel canyon uh i hear john holmes is down the street we don't have that much time <laughs> in the end the brothers got away with 45 dollars in cash the, the money, perfect crime yep the money that larry referred to had already been spent on redecorating his music room <laughs> so they were both arrested in bell gardens after about six days after leaving a very colorful trail of clues for them they were both sentenced to life in prison tom was released from prison after being granted early parole at the age of 25 he ended up returning 
returning to prison after raping a 54-year-old woman. Oh, my God. Paul Ferguson was released after several years, but found himself back in prison in Missouri for raping a woman. And the justice system keeps on not working. <laughs> At Ramon Navarro's funeral, over 1,000 people attended his open casket funeral. Why would you have an open <laughs> casket if someone was beaten to death? They can do wonderful things with <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> silly putty or whatever. He is silly putty. <laughs> He's buried at the Calvary Cemetery in East LA, but in case you missed his 1968 oh, some, I, I swear, I swear to God, someone else from last few months episode is buried there. Go on. We'll, we'll look into it. Yeah, if you, know. you missed his 1968 funeral, which you probably did, you could still pay Navarro a visit at his former residence, 3110 Laurel Canyon Drive. There are reports of poltergeists moving things in the home. Uh, but many the worst kind of ghosts. Yeah, because they move stuff. Many people just say that it has an eerie feeling as if someone was probably Somebody killed here. It feels weird. In 1970, a stuntman named... Why do I want to name my child Larry? <laughs> In 1970, a stuntman named Ryan Kelly, who was also a fan of Navarro's, started dressing like Navarro after he moved... Oh, I forgot to mention that he bought the house and moved in. When he lived there, he started dressing like Navarro and even decorated his home the way it was when the actor was murdered. Wait. Like on purpose or yeah? Oh, that's weird. He put ads out yeah, looking. Both would be weird. Yeah, both are. I mean, one's spooky, one's just dumb. <laughs> he put out ads looking for original decor and furniture from the home that belonged to the actor that would have been in the house when he was killed. Like he wanted to re-establish the scene yeah. of the crime. Bring me that condom. I hear it's not used. <laughs> Bring me the condom of doom. <laughs> Bring me the condom of Alfredo Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't use them. <laughs> In 1980, Connie Chung heard about this and filmed a TV show called Two on the Town, which was either a haunted house show or it had an episode, at least, that was about a haunted house. Filmed there in Laurel Canyon home, and several crew members refused to enter the house. Really? Saying that they just had an overwhelming sense of dread. Ugh. Years oh. later, Kelly and his brother were having an argument in the house, and when Kelly was about to leave, he turned to his brother, who had a gun to his own head, and fired and killed himself. What? Kelly then sold the house. <laughs> That's Roman Navarro's house. 